The way we've been going about it um, at the Times is to is to structure these stories as how done it, not who done it, but how. We get very granular, very minute. Exactly how do you make change? Claudia Rowe with the Seattle Times. Um, education is a really obvious area, I think, to focus a solutions journalism angle because it is so politicized, it is so polarized, certainly in the States, it, is, it, it has devolved into a screaming match from every angle. Um, but to back up a little bit, the Seattle Times took, I think it was three years to work out an agreement between the Gates Foundation, the Solutions Journalism Network, which is based in New York, and a nonprofit based in New York, and the Times. And the basic gist of this is um, to tell you guys another model, um, about as opposite um, from Sam's as there could be, a massive, massive amount of money and massive organizations that are very powerful funding um, solutions-oriented journalism. And it naturally brings up some questions. The Seattle Times received a $425,000 grant. Um, the Gates Foundation gave the money to Solutions Journalism Network in New York, and they are technically our funders. They gave the money to the Times. That money went to fund uh, three employees, one of them is me, it was three hires, um, as well as, so salary, benefits, um, a travel budget, and a bunch of ancillary stuff like extra photo, graphics, editing costs. The plan is to do at least a year of very sort of what I would call high-level enterprise reporting, looking for solutions in education. Um, in Seattle particularly, this had resonance because the situation there around public schools had devolved, as I said, um, into nothing but a screaming match on every single story and every single topic. Um, so I think that the paper had a real interest in trying to see if it was possible through this solutions journalism lens to shift the tenor of the conversation. We've now run two stories. Our first one came out in October. The second was last week. They were both mine. They were both on education. And they, so it's early in this unusual experiment of a big money funder, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, through a middleman in New York, essentially funding education. And the reason this brings up a, a, a lot of questions is that the Gates Foundation is a player in education, a very powerful player with a very distinct agenda. There are a lot of questions, but there are our charter school, they have funded, um, they essentially funded the law that passed in Washington last year that will allow charter schools. Um, a lot of teachers union folks see them as very anti-union as well. So there is a real question about the agenda here and what kind of control um, might be behind our stories. And that's the first question that came up from readers. And we've been um, explicitly transparent at every step in the process. And every time we run a story, we run um, who's behind it and, what's, and, and where the funding comes from. But naturally, um, we are sensitive to the fact that that Gates is a player. And that has led us to essentially bend over backwards the other way, to vet our stories even more closely, to scrupulously look for um, agendas at work, and to use some of the tenets of solutions journalism, which I would call, I would call it investigative reporting, and instead of investigating failure and corruption and, and wrongdoing like we traditionally have, um, it's investigating solutions. So it's using data and research and really rigorous um, skepticism and question asking, just like you would do with a standard investigative project. It's, it's on the ground interviewing, it's all the stuff that everybody likes about investigative reporting, but it's looking um, for answers as opposed to looking to expose or looking to point a finger of blame. The concept was, if we do this and investigate answers, will we change the tone of the conversation? Will it in fact become a conversation as opposed to a screaming match? 
And as I say, it is very early in this year-long experiment, but so far I would say it's very promising, more promising than I would have even anticipated. I've done a lot of stories over the years. I'm a, traditionally a social issues journalist. I cover juvenile justice and gangs a lot. Um, so I've written a lot of stuff that got a lot of heat, but I've never seen the kind of thoughtful response from readers that these stories are generating. Um, it's not puffy, happy, unicorns and rainbows stuff. It's not, oh, thanks. It is, um, however, a sincere appreciation, and you can hear it in the, in the comments and the people who call. It's as if, it's as if we gave readers a drink of water when they were parched. I really, I, I don't mean to sound kind of corny about it, but it's surprised me, the um, appreciation and the sense of, uh, uh, from readers, the sense of giving them something to chew on, some real information, um, and pointing at ways that, that you can move the dial, not only in the tenor of the conversation around a complex social issue, but in showing people that, that, there, that there is a way to make headway, that there are ways to educate kids, particularly very difficult populations of kids, that you can move the dial on something that seemed, um, I think, hopeless to a lot of people. And I think that really is um, a lot of the driver behind solutions journalism. It's really the driver behind watchdog journalism, sort of traditional investigative journalism, which was to present a situation and hopefully galvanize readers um, to action. And I think we became so good at being these scrupulous whistleblowers with our dire paintings of misery that we bludgeoned readers into depression. And um, I go around Washington State giving talks about journalism a lot, and that's what I hear all the time. Um, from just regular folks gathering in libraries and, and rotary clubs. This sense of uh, desperation about, you know, show us what we can do, don't, or show us what might be working or why there could be a reason for, for looking forward and for hope. We all know how bad it is in every area. Um, and, and as other speakers have said, you need to show the problem to talk about the solution. But the way we've been going about it um, at the Times is to, is to structure these stories as how done it's, not who done it, but how. And so more presenting, presenting the evidence or presenting the, the evidence of success right at the top and then backtracking. How did this happen? We get very granular, very minute. Um, exactly how do you make change. The first story that we did was about um, this little elementary school, in a, not in the Seattle School District, right next door, a very uh, poor school district that nobody ever looked at because Seattle gets all the attention. No one was ever looking at this district and this school had languished with horrible scores for years. It educated a very low income population, um, almost every kid there was a student of color. So this is sort of traditionally in, in states what we would call you know, emblematic of the achievement gap. The school had been sort of limping along with these low level, low, low level achievement. All the kids are kids of color and nobody really was doing anything. Then suddenly in nine months, principal comes in, nine months later the scores are like double digit, every grade, every subject, everything across the school. So somebody tipped me off to this and the first thing we think is, oh, cheating, you know, <laughs> like we're journalists, we think, ah, graft, cheating. Um, but uh, I looked deeper at what exactly was being done instructionally um, to make these changes in student achievement and that, and that became our first story, this how done it, exactly how do you move the dial with kids? How do you teach kids who are in fifth grade but read at a second grade level? How do you raise those scores? How do you make them literate? Can it be done? Apparently it can be done. The issue of the questions about who's behind this project and the money, I think, I think go, goes um, to the issue of results and measurement. I think the three players here, the Seattle Times, the Solutions Journalism Network, and the Gates Foundation, 
are all measuring what we're doing in different ways, and they all have different metrics for what would be considered a success. Um, the Seattle Times wants readers to be engaged. We want more readers reading longer and getting involved. The Solutions Journalism Network, um, I think, is looking to see if this is a model that works for journalism in a time of great change and turmoil in the industry. Um, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation may have their own ways of measuring what we're doing. And this is gonna obviously unfold over the course of a year. But I would say there are early indications that they have certain things that they want to measure about audience knowledge on certain education topics. I will say that we have not had any kind of um, push or pressure on cover this or don't cover that or cover it this way or look here. But we as reporters are you know, highly sensitive to any kind of uh, red flag that might pop up in that area. And we'll just have to see where it unfolds. Um, so far, I would say very well. and It's gone very well. I think it's almost impossible not to encounter the Gates Foundation somewhere when you're writing about education. They're everywhere in the US on this. Um, but we will have to apply extra scruples when evaluating whether something that they may also be funding is indeed a, a solution or a success. Thanks.